Chapter 2. The Diving Environment As a diver, you need to know how to move in and under the water in such a way that you can protect yourself and the life forms you encounter as well. Waves are measured in terms of their height, length, and period. The wavelength is the horizontal distance between successive crests, and the period is the time required for two successive crests to pass a given point. The water particles within a wave move in an orbital motion as the waves move forward. Beneath the surface, the orbits become smaller and smaller, finally diminishing to nothing. As waves move into shallower water, the bottom begins to interfere with the orbital motion of the water. The orbits flatten into ellipses, and the net movement of the water becomes the back and forth surge motion. When you are diving, surge will sweep you back and forth as the waves pass overhead. Diving in strong surge can be hazardous and should be avoided. As the lower portion of a wave is slowed in shallow water, the top portion moves faster than the bottom and an unstable condition results. The broken wave, known as surf, forms a white water area. This area is known as the surf zone. On a gradually sloping beach, a moderately large swell will form spilling breakers. These waves break far from the shore and continue to break all the way to the beach. The water is usually turbid in the surf zone due to the sediment that is disturbed over a wide area. Plunging breakers release their energy quickly. This type of surf forms from large swells over a moderately steep bottom. As the swell moves toward shore, the waves steepen quickly and break suddenly. These waves break with tremendous force and they are the most hazardous type. Larger ones over one meter or three feet can easily knock over a standing diver. A high surf on a steeply sloping beach can be dangerous for a fully equipped diver. If conditions are reasonable, the following procedures are suggested. Have your BC partially inflated for slight positive buoyancy, time the sets and lulls to coincide your entry with the smallest waves, and enter the water as quickly as possible. Swim beyond the surf zone quickly before the next wave breaks. This is an advanced skill. If you lose your balance, do not try to stand up again. Crawl forward on your hands and knees and begin swimming rather than using your energy trying to stand. When exiting through surf, stop outside the surf zone and evaluate the surf conditions. Your exit should be timed so you ride the back of the last large wave of a set. Keep a hand on your mask and your regulator in your mouth if waves are breaking on you in the surf zone. Keep all equipment in place until clear of the water when exiting through surf. Avoid having a float between yourself and oncoming waves or the float could be pushed into and over you. Tides are the predictable periodic rising and falling of waters, primarily due to the gravitational attraction of the moon. The moon, being much closer to the earth, influences tides about twice as much as the sun. When spring tides coincide with a perigee, the highest tides of the year are produced. And when neap tides coincide with an apogee, the lowest tides of the year occur. Note that spring in this context has nothing to do with the seasons. Diurnal, daily, one high and one low tide occurring every 24 hours and 50 minutes, time required for the moon to pass a fixed point on the earth twice. Semi-diurnal, twice daily, two high and two low tides of approximately equal height every 24 hours and 50 minutes. A tidal change occurs approximately every six hours. Mixed, a combination of diurnal and semi-diurnal, the heights are unequal. A tidal current is periodic horizontal water movement associated with tides reversing direction of flow as the tide changes. Water flowing toward shore or upstream with a rising tide is called a flood tide, and water flowing offshore or downstream with a falling tide is called an ebb tide. At each reversal of current, a short period of little or no current exists called slack water. During flow in each direction, the speed will vary from zero at the time of slack water to maximum strength about midway between the slack periods. Divers should use local tide tables. Personal evaluations of water movement must be made in order to determine slack water times, which often present more favorable diving conditions. When the surface of a large, partially enclosed body of water is disturbed, long waves may be established. These waves, called seiches, have a period that depends on the size and depth of the basin. 
Seiches can affect diving by reducing visibility and by rapidly changing the water level at entry and exit points. In addition to tidal currents, there are several other types of currents with which you should be familiar. Waves approaching shore at an angle cause a current system that flows parallel to shore. These currents, which can achieve a velocity too great to swim against when the surf is large, are known as longshore currents. A longshore current can move you down the beach, perhaps to an undesirable exit area. A rip current is formed by water seeking its own level. These currents are the leading cause of surf rescues of swimmers and can pose problems for divers when encountered unexpectedly. If you are in a rip and wish to get out, do so by swimming perpendicular to the current. There are four types of rip currents. Permanent, formed by a rock channel or subsurface topography which changes very little. A fixed rip is second in longevity of location only to a permanent rip current. A hole or gully in the offshore bottom can create a rip current that can last from several hours up to several months. Flash, temporary in nature for any given location, caused by a large surf buildup during a short period of time. Traveling. A traveling rip current is propelled along a shore frontage by a strong longshore current. The velocity of a wind-produced current depends on the speed of the wind, its constancy, the length of time it blows, and other factors. The set and drift of a current refer to the current's direction and velocity, respectively. If unexpectedly caught downstream from your planned exit point, return upstream on the bottom if air is available. Pulling hand over hand may be required. Exit at a pre-planned alternate exit location. Always begin the dive against a current and not with it unless trained, prepared, and equipped to make a drift dive. Stay close to the bottom, pull yourself along, and avoid unnecessary kicking which can lead to overexertion and fatigue. Turn around with at least one half of your air supply remaining and return with the current. A trail line of at least 30 meters, 100 feet in length, should be extended from the dive boat for divers to use to pull themselves back to the vessel hand over hand if they surface downstream. Note that the maximum swimming speed of a fully equipped physically fit scuba diver is about 0.5 meters per second, one knot, and even that may be sustainable for only a brief period depending on the diver's fitness. Swimming against a 0.5 meter per second, one knot current is therefore unwise because it will quickly lead to exhaustion. During summer months, the surface waters of lakes and quarries are warmed by the sun and form a layer of water called the epilimnion. Beneath this, a cold and dense layer of water called a hypolimnion remains. Between the two layers is a thin horizontal zone of temperature demarcation called thermocline. When the water temperature is about 6 degrees Celsius, 43 degrees Fahrenheit, wind-caused circulation is sufficient to destroy the thermocline and mix the entire water column, producing an isothermal or same temperature condition. Further cooling then produces sufficiently less dense surface water and a reverse thermocline condition is developed. A halocline is a horizontal boundary between waters of different salinity. In some situations where fresh water comes in contact with seawater, the waters remain separate in layers due to differences in density. At the boundary where the two layers come into contact, mixing occurs. This boundary, which can be several feet deep, affects your perception as you pass through it. There are four basic plant and animal life zones in the ocean. Intertidal, or littoral, are plants and animals in the region between high and low tides. Planktonic are drifting and floating forms that are at the mercy of the wind and current. The most common plants in the oceans are the phytoplankton, which are algae that use sunlight to produce carbohydrates. They represent the basic food source for all life in the oceans. Nectonic are free-swimming forms, including fish, which rely on speed and streamlining for their survival. Some live at a constant depth in one area, while others prefer the open seas. Benthic are bottom-dwelling organisms such as clams, anemones, and sea stars. They can live on all types of bottoms including rock, sand, or mud. Venomous animals are those creatures capable of producing a toxin and of delivering this toxin through a sting or bite. Poisonous animals are those creatures whose tissue, either in part or in their entirety, are toxic. In general, marine oral toxins are small molecules that are heat-stable or unaffected by cooking. 
Divers often gather things from the sea to eat. If you collect and eat contaminated shellfish, you could be poisoned. This is a seasonal toxin and only occurs when there has been a dinoflagellate bloom or red tide. Ciguatera fish poisoning is probably the most common ichthyosarcotoxism found worldwide. It is a disease with both neurologic and gastrointestinal symptoms. Various reef-dwelling fishes may transmit the poison or group of toxins known as ciguatoxin. The most dangerous of all food poisonings is without a doubt those produced by tetrodotoxin, which is a very potent material found in the flesh of pufferfish, globefish, blowfish, or swellfish, what the Japanese refer to as fugu. It really is quite easy to reduce your chance of being stung by most creatures in the ocean. The first rule is to always wear protective clothing, whether you are diving in the tropics or temperate waters. A second rule would be to always make sure you wear gloves and boots protecting your hands and feet. Cnidarians contain some of the most venomous animals known, although the vast majority are harmless. These animals include true coral, soft corals, fire coral, jellyfish, and sea anemones. These animals have tentacles with stinging cells called nematocysts that deliver the venom. Some can penetrate the human skin, others can't. Echinoderms include sea stars, sea urchins, and sea cucumbers. Sea urchins have spines, some of which are hollow and brittle. They can penetrate the skin and break off. Starfish spines are not poisonous except for the crown of thorns found in the Pacific. There are many venomous fish such as stingrays, scorpionfish, and stonefish. As soon as the spines from these animals enter the skin, there is an immediate intense pain that may become excruciating over the next hour. The pain may persist for six to ten hours before diminishing. Another group of venomous marine animals are sea snakes. They inhabit the tropical Pacific and Indian Ocean. They are potentially lethal. Divers should always give them full and thorough respect. There are seven principal marine predators, barracuda, moray eels, large grouper, sharks, poisonous sea snakes, killer whales, and some seals or sea lions. They all have two things in common. Humans are not their normal prey, and they rarely bite humans. This should be comforting, but if they do bite, the consequences can be devastating. One major problem associated with marine pollution is called bioaccumulation. In biomagnification, the bioaccumulation is passed up through the food chain through various trophic levels so that the concentration of the compound becomes increased. This is why the top organisms in the food chain, like fishes, tend to have the highest concentration of pollutants. Divers, in particular, can have many direct effects on the environment. In diving, a conservation ethic is to leave it better than you found it. Non-destructive diving includes good buoyancy control, not allowing fins, gauges, bags to contact the bottom, not touching the bottom or organisms, and demonstrating care for the aquatic world.